And we are continuing in Acts chapter 18 today. And uh, and we're going to be looking at verses 18 through 23 today. 18 through 23. We, we see just beforehand, and uh, Paul going, going into Corinth. He's in Corinth, and he's been rejected by most there, primarily the Jews in Corinth, who accused him of teaching things that were against the law. And this was a constant thing that was happening with Paul. And, and so he was there, and, and he ended up, remember where he ended up being? He ended up being in Justice's house, where he was able to, to preach the gospel there and be, the, the, be in his house for a year and a half. And, uh, and then be taken into the, the Bema seat in Corinth where he went before Gallio, who Gallio was a political hack, but he judged righteously that, that the Roman government had nothing to do with the religious affairs of the Jews. So he wiped his hands of that. And also, before that, Paul had had a vision from the Lord that things are going to be okay, just go, just preach, preach what you will, because I have many people there. And then we see that taking place. So today when we pick up the scriptures, we find him now uh, leaving after that, not just a year and a half, it was more than likely a little over a year and a half, but he was a year and a half just in the house of justice, where many people were saved to the consternation of the Jews. So we're going to pick it up in verse 18, and we'll read to the end of the chapter, and then we're going to go back through 18, uh, 18 through 23. It says, And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sancria, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus, and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you, if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went all over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto, unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come helped them much, which had believed through grace." For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. And may the Lord add his blessing to his word this morning. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. I titled this uh, message this morning, I called it the Sancrean haircut. It's because there's a lot of things that, ooh, good thing that wasn't open. Uh, there's a lot of things that we see here that we're saying, wait, wait a minute. Paul, the, the messenger of the grace of God to the Gentiles, here he is talking about fulfilling a vow. Well, there was a reason. Because he had a love for his countrymen, the Jews. So he had a love, so he would do things that pertain to the law in order to win over his, his countrymen, the Jews. Let's turn right away to, to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. We don't have to go far. We just look at verse number one. 
Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. What a prayer that is. Paul could have penned that last song we sang, we sang today. I'm praying for you. No matter what's going on with the nation of Israel, even though at this point in Paul's ministry, the Jews had, had re rejected Jesus Christ, they rejected the gospel, his, still, his number one motivation is that Israel would be saved, that they might be saved. And this is important because one day, when the times of refreshing from the Lord will come, the regeneration will come, when Jesus comes in his kingdom and in his power, all Israel will be saved. Then they will be obedient to the Lord in that kingdom. So brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to the knowledge. They had a zeal in their outward performance, but didn't believe in their hearts. Oh, how true that is of even today, the nation of Israel, even though the nation itself has gone further and further away from the Lord, those that would call them Orthodox Jews, Orthodox Christians even, are basing things on external appearances and the things they do. You know, it's, it's, it's incredible what happens when we see that much of the religious world, us included, look to what you do to perform, to receive from the Lord, but yet all of our blessings come not from us performing, but us believing in the performance of the Lord Jesus Christ. I could read further into, into to Romans chapter 10, but I'm going to leave it there. His desire was that all of Israel would be saved. Now, let, now let's go back to, back to Acts 18. He had such a desire for, his Israel, for Israel to be saved that if it were possible, he would even become accursed. But it wasn't possible because if, he, if you trusted in what Jesus did, Jesus called Paul himself, even today, if you believe the gospel, it's impossible be, to be accursed unless you believed in vain and not really believed. So Acts chapter 18, once again, down to verse 18, says, And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while. So we saw a year and a half, and then a good while after. Whether the year and a half he was there is inclusive of that, I'm not quite sure. He tarried there a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. But look what he did before, and having and having shorn his head in Sancreia, he had a vow. Sancreia was a port city on the other side of the isthmus from Corinth, and that's where you would catch a boat. His destination was Syria to go to Antioch to visit the home base of the Christian church, and he would land in, in Caesarea, the port city. But look at, he shorn his head because for he had a vow. But before we go there, it's interesting because Priscilla and Aquila go there. We don't know why they went there, went with him, but they landed, they went together and went to Ephesus where Priscilla and Aquila would stay and they would have, and I put the air quotes up again, a chance meeting with one Apollos where they were able to teach the scriptures more to him. That's an amazing story right there of what happens, and I think that'll be next week. Priscilla and Aquila joined him on, on the voyage across the isthmus over into Ephesus. Ephesus was a main port city in modern-day Turkey today, but in Asia, where he would go, and they would go, and he would stay with them. So he was planning on going back to Antioch, but there would be a couple things that he would take care of beforehand. So we see this, he had Priscilla and Aquila, it says, and shorn his head in Sancreia, for he had a vow. A vow. 
What kind of vow did Paul have? Why would Paul take a vow? If he was now saved by grace, what's he doing having a Jewish vow? Let's go for a second over to, to Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6. And we'll give the background of, of this. Numbers chapter 6. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves to the Lord. So we see this vow here was more than likely the Nazarite vow. And what was the main point of it? Right here in verse 2. To separate himself to the Lord. Now look what the Nazarite did. We think of John the Baptist. We think of other Nazarites. Uh, Samson, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink and shall no, drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled, in the which he separateth himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy and shall let the locks of his hair grow, of his head grow. All the day that, days that he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. It's interesting because in the next chapter, in, in chapter 20, you have a young man named Eutychus who died while Paul was sleeping because he fell out of, the win out of the window. And Paul went to him and healed him. So he, that vow of separation was over. But then we, we see him in Acts 21, which we'll, we'll get to in a few minutes. I'm getting ahead of myself. He shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother or for his sister when they die, because the consecration of his God is upon his, set, his head. All the days of his separation, he is holy unto the Lord. Now, I want to skip a few verses here with all the different... Uh, no, I don't want to skip any. And if any, my, any man die very suddenly by him... And he hath defiled the head of his consecration, then he shall shave his head in the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day shall he shave it. And on the eighth day he shall bring two turtles or two young pigeons to the priest, to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering and make an atonement for him in faith that he sinned by the dead and shall hallow his head that same day. And he shall consecrate unto the Lord the days of his separation and shall bring a lamb of the first year for a trespass offering. But the days that were before shall be lost because his separation was defiled. And this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he shall offer his offering unto the Lord, one he lamb of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering, and one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish for a sin offering, and one ram without blemish for peace offerings." And a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mingled with oil, and waters of unleavened bread anointed with oil, and their meat offerings, and their drink offerings. And the priest shall bring them before the Lord, and shall offer his sin offering and his burnt offering. And he shall offer the ram for a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord with the basket of unleavened bread. The priest shall offer also his meat offering and his drink offering. And the Nazarite shall shave the head of his separation at the day of his tabernacle of the congregation and shall take the hair of the head of his separation and put it into the fire which is under the sacrifice of the peace offerings. 
And the priest shall take the, the sodden shoulder of the ram and, and one unleavened cake out of the basket and one unleavened wafer and shall put them upon the hands of the Nazarite after the hair of his separation is shaven. And the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. This is holy for the priest with the wave breast and heave shoulder. And after that, the, Nazareth, the Nazarite may drink wine. This is the law of the Nazarite who hath vowed and of his offering unto the Lord for his separation. Beside that, his hand shall get according to the vow which he vowed. So he must do after the law of his separation. So this is the background. I do, we went through the entire thing and we, we, we don't have time to go through all of the minutiae of this separation and of the sacrifice. But Paul being a Jew, he was of the tribe of Benjamin, but yet he would be given this incredible gospel of grace, goes and he shaves his head in order, we'll look at that, in order to be as a Jew. All right, we, we know we, we go, we'll go over to 1 Corinthians 9 and 10 in a couple minutes. So he had this vow, and when did he take this vow? It was either when he was cast out of, out of Thessalonica or when he, when he got into, into uh, Corinth and saw the sin that was all around there, the idol worship that was taking place, and ultimately what happened there in Athens? He was rejected by his own countrymen, which was something that would take place quite often. Let's go back to Acts chapter 6 for a second. Acts chapter 6. Let's go to... Uh, <laughs> Let's go to verse number nine. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to re resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. And they suburned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And, and all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel, then said the high priest, are these things so? Uh, and I'm going to end it right there. So the stoning of Stephen why was he stoned? Because he was accused of blaspheming Moses. He was accused of blaspheming the nation of Israel and the law, which he didn't do. They even made up lies about him to do so. And this is the same thing that would happen with, with the Apostle Paul. Let's go over to Acts chapter 21. We'll go back to Acts 21 again as well. Acts chapter 21, and plus where we just were in Acts chapter chapter 18 as well, but we'll go back there as well. Acts chapter 21. Let's go all the way down to verse number... This is, it's, by the way, this is when, when Paul goes back to Jerusalem. This is about... This is the same time as he would go to Jerusalem and he would offer up the sacrifices according to his vow. We'll go back here again. It says, And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of, men of Israel, help! This is the man... Yeah, you in the right place? Acts 21. Verse 28 now. 
crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man, talking about Paul here, that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law in this place and further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. For they had seen before with him in the city Trophimus and Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. Trophimus went in on his own accord. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. And, and as they were about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, who, imme who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. And I'm going to end it right there. This is the, the uprising of the Jews, and this is when, when Paul would be taken by Caesar into Rome, where he would minister to Rome in his last days. But there was that accusation of Paul that he was teaching contrary to the law. Let's go back. Where were we in Acts 21? Let's go back a bit here. I should have gone back to start with. No, it was still in Acts 21. Still in Acts 21. We'll go back to 18. Verse 17 of Acts 21. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. This is kind of a sim similar picture of what happened in, in, in Acts chapter 13, where they, they saw the ministry of Paul, and, they, and the, they saw the work that was among the Gentiles, and then they agreed that the Gentiles weren't going to be under the Jewish law, except for they keep away from things strangled with blood and idolatry, basically. So he says, they received this gladly, or actually verse number 19, and when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. So the Jews believed, but they were zealous of the law. This is this transition period where, where there's both Jew and Greek together. And the Jews were still, after all, think of us ourselves too. We may have come out of religious backgrounds. We still remember those things, don't we? I still remember the calisthenics I used to have to do, not that I practiced them. But this was a brand new thing going on where the, where the doctrine of grace was upon them, and yet they believed but they had been under the traditions of the law all this time. And says, in verse number 21 says, And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that, that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Which is true. But notice this is, this is a positive thing going on here. Here's what they are hearing. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear thee. Thou art come. Do therefore this that we say th to thee. So here's the one thing you're going to do. Here's James and the elders here in Jerusalem. Paul, here's what you're going to do. This is going to quell their concerns they have. We have four men which have a vow on them. To get, get the tie in here? They have four men. These are believers. They believe the gospel, but they have a vow on them. They've taken a vow already. Do they not take the vow, or do they go ahead and do it? James' decision was they take the vow. Even today, some of you might know Messianic Jews. They celebrate uh, bar mitzvah and those type of things. Are those things wrong for them to do? No. They're not wrong. They're not necessary for us to do. There's no salvation through that. 
but there are customs that were in the Bible that they still follow. So we have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify thyself with them. In other words, you're going to be seen going into the temple, you who they are being accused of being against the law, against Moses, you're going to go into the temple with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads. Paul's was already shaven at this time. He didn't shave his head, but he went and did the appropriate sacrifices with them. This is where he would go in and he would offer up a turtle dove or, or pigeon, whatever was required of the law, and he would take the hair that he had shown off and it would go on the fire and these four men would do the same thing. That they may shave their heads and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing. In other words, you don't hate the customs, you don't hate your people. Remember where we started? His desire was that all of Israel might be saved. So, we, so there are nothing but that thou thyself also walk, walkest orderly and keepest the law. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing save only that they keep them things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. Then Paul took the men and the next day, puring himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the, uh, the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. And here's where we started in the middle and went back to the beginning. Here's where they went back. Even in spite of him going into the temple with these four gentlemen to take those vows, they still were against him. This would be the, this would be the, the, the picture that they would have of Paul forever, that he is against the Jews, against the laws, even though he loved them so much and desired their salvation. Let's go, let's look at somebody else who was, who was accused of, of destroying the law. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I may chase a rabbit here a minute for a minute too. Matthew chapter 5. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Verse number 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. This is Jesus fulfilled every requirement of the law and the prophets in his coming. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And I was going to stop there, but I, I, I had to look at the next verse here. Do, if we see any contradictions Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to end it right there for a second. Interesting. Be least if you break one commandment, and then your righteousness has to be right more righteous than the Pharisees. That's impossible. Amen? It's impossible. How can we be righteous? How can these people be righteous and obey all of the law? Right? And to be least in the kingdom. I'll give you the easy answer of it here. Let's turn over to Ezekiel 36. See, the Sermon on the Mount 
though it has so many great things we can learn from it, is, is not something that is applicable for us today. There's a lot of timeless principles and truths that are true, but it's not applicable for us today that, that's because these things are impossible to keep. If you read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, all impossibilities, it takes a special kind of purpose, a person to be obedient to the Sermon on the Mount. I heard a, a, a real false teacher uh, recently, and he was talking about the miracles that took place right after the Sermon on the Mount, and he said, but he, he did these things right after the Sermon on the Mount, which, which are impossible for us to keep. And that I said, amen. It's impossible to keep. So that's why we go to Ezekiel 36. I only have a couple verses writ written down, but you know me. Ezekiel 36. Already I'm going backwards where I will... All right, verse 23. This would be a good place to go home and read the whole, whole chapter. But. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I, will sh when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. How is, how is God going to be sanctified by Israel before the eyes of the Gentile. It's going to be the millennial reign of Jesus Christ when he comes and he rules in the kingdom. For I will take you from among the heathen. You see this fulfillment in Revelation 12 when the four angels will gather the elect from the four winds of heaven and gather them back into the land at the second coming. I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. I am bound for the promised land. That's what this is about right here. This is about the Jews coming back. That was uh, verse 24 of Ezekiel 36. He's bring you into the land, and then I will, sp then I will, spring, uh, will sprinkle clean water upon you. Again, who's the you here? It's important. It's the you is the nation of Israel. And ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from your, all your idols will I cleanse you. Now look at verse 26. You want to see how, how the, the, the Sermon on the Mount can be obeyed? A new heart also will I give you. I like to think that of us too. We had a, a stony heart as well, but particularly here, it's the nation of Israel and the regeneration a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. So they will be able to obey the commandments of God in the millennial kingdom. This is, this is amazing how this happens. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from all uncleanness, and I will call for the corn and will increase it, and lay no famine upon you. All right, I'd love to read the rest, but I, just because of, because of the time constraints. Yeah, we have until like 2 o'clock, though, right? No, but just if you look at all of Ezekiel 36, you can see the blessings upon Israel, and they will obey. People get that confused. People think that Israel was, will be saved by keeping the law, but it's going to be God is going to give them a new heart in order to keep the law, right? It's going to be through faith. Just like us today, we are not saved by keeping any of the law. We're not saved by, by doing these outward things. We're saved by the grace of God. And yet, we do those outward things. I've been, 
I've been in, in churches before where, where there was so much of the law was placed upon Christians, it was ridiculous. You know, there used to be some churches would have a requirement that, that men's hair couldn't touch their ears. Imagine that, try that one. Yeah, you, you're all in some trouble. Women, and women are not uh, exempt. Women, if their hemline was above the knee, you had to be a heathen. Now, I think men should be modest in their hair. Even, even in 1 Corinthians 11, you know, Paul said yeah, it's, a shame, it's a shame. Nature himself says it's a shame for men to have long hair. Does long hair unsave you? Are you saved by cutting your hair? No. Are women lost if they wear a dress above their knees? No. There are proper things to do and moderation to be done, but that's not in order to be saved or keep salvation. It's part of our sanctification that we have. Let's go to another verse, I, I, Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59, one more place here. And by the way, the good place to go is read from Isaiah 40 through 66. And the context of that is the millennial kingdom right through. They say Isaiah 59. Again, to not read the whole chapter is tough, but it's a short chapter, though. So Isaiah 59, verse number. Let's see, we had judgment up through verse 18. All right, let's uh, go to verse 20. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion. That's the, who's the Redeemer? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to physically come. And unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord, as for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. Again, the new covenant, Jeremiah chapter 30. That said, the new covenant is with Israel when, when God puts his spirit upon, upon them, inside them. Again, you can look at that, how they will fulfill the Sermon on the Mount. My spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord, and henceforth and forever. I could go to the next chapter, which is beautiful too. But the reality is they'll have a constitution we have a constitution that nobody follows here in, in our country, right? Did you ever read it? I don't think our politicians have ever read it. But there will be a constitution in the millennial kingdom. And if you, people follow it, they're promoted in the kingdom. If they don't follow it, they'll be judged by the judge. The king of kings and lord of lords, the judge of all the world, will be right there in the midst. No Clarence Thomas. No, whatever the other uh, Supreme Court people are, no Robert Breyer or any, anything like that, Jesus himself in perfect righteousness will judge his people. But he was accused of the same thing as Paul, of threatening to tear down the nation, tempt, threatening to tear down the, the temple, threatening to do away with Moses and Abraham, his famous words in John chapter 8, before Abraham was, I am. Amen? So this is what's going to happen with, with, with Israel, with, with this vow that's going to take place. It's going to show Paul's empathy with the nation of Israel, which is a good place to, to go back to Acts chapter 18, just to, just to get that in context. Acts chapter 18, once again. So he show, he, 
And, and with him, Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sincrea, for he had a vow. So why? Why did Paul keep that vow? Because he became all things to all men. Now today, with this, so many people taking that to total extremes. I've heard of places called Triple X Church, where they have strippers. Triple X Church in order to win the lost. That's an extreme. It's a place called Stripper Church. These are all realities that people are saying they're taking Paul's words that, that he has in 1 Corinthians 9 and 10 totally out of context. Paul followed those customs of the Jews in order to win his countrymen. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians 9. Look at verse 19. Though I, though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. Unto, and unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law as without law being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. In other words, he didn't break the law. He didn't break, uh, he didn't break God's law, but he had the law of the Spirit and life and godliness in Christ that was in him. So there's no way Paul would do something that would be sinful in order to bring the lost. You know, like sinful, like twisting scriptures. That's a sin that's used so often to draw the lost. To the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake that I might be partaker thereof with you. I like that, the partakers with the Corinthians, who were, were all over the place. But I'm with you. I'm going to partake with you in the gospel. Let's go over to, to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10. Verse number 31. This is one I could go back to the beginning. Verse 31 says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense neither to the Jews nor the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men and all things, not seeking mine own profit, but, but the profit of many, that they might be saved. And if you remember, the beginning of 1 Corinthians 10 dealt with people eating things that were offered unto idols. Paul's position was that there is no other God but God, so those idols are nothing. But if you be with a weaker brethren, abstain from those foods just as well. And who are the weaker brethren? It's not the ones that go for anything. The weaker brethren were those who withheld the law. Oh no, I'm going to not eat that squid because it's unclean. Go along with it. I'm not going to eat any unclean foods because the law says I can't. Is it a sin not to eat squid? Some would say, yes, it is a sin to eat squid still, which I love, but, but the reality, the weaker brethren are the ones that hold to the law in all things, rather 
than to the grace of God. By the grace of God, 1 Timothy chapter 6 says, we be thankful for all things. Whatever is set before you, eat. That you're able to take it and eat it with thanksgiving to God. So thank God for the peanut butter and jelly that we have. Thank God. That is a good question. I just thought of this. If you were there all by yourself in this world, nobody else around, and suddenly a plate full of, what are the little fish called? Sardines. Now, some people love sardines. But if you don't love sardines, and there was nothing else to eat but those sardines, would you eat it? No. I would. <laughs> or if you're a Jew, and there's nothing left except for a nice pound of bacon, would you eat it? The weak Jew would say no, because it's against the law. The proper view is that has been provided by God. Praise the Lord. Give me two pounds. Amen. That's, what, that's the difference that we have. But Paul became a Jew in these formal observances in order to win his countrymen. It's, it's amazing how we did that. And you see what happened in Acts chapter 21. He was still accused of the same things by the Jews. You know why? Because the God of this world had already been blinding them to the truth of the gospel. They were going to reject the cross and the resurrection no matter what. Just as they had rejected the life of Christ, they would continue to do so. They can still continue to look forward to fulfilling the law, but Jesus Christ had come and he fulfilled that law. Wow. I was gonna look at the fact and remember, remember Timothy? Where, where did Timothy first meet up with Paul? It was in Lystra. Paul had been stoned to death there in Lystra, and Timothy, whose mother was a Jew and his father was a Greek, went and joined up with Paul, and right away, Timothy was circumcised. Remember why? It was so that he could be a testimony to the Jews there in Lystra. Then, likewise, Titus, let's go to Galatians chapter 2 for a second. Galatians chapter 2. Let's go to... Uh, Let's go to verse 1. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. The, the revelation that Paul was communicating was the revelation of the mystery of of, of the church that would come. Look at verse 3. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they, they might bring us into bondage. So here was a Greek, Titus, being brought into Antioch, and he wasn't compelled to be circumcised as a testimony to the false teachers of the grace of God. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth, the gospel, might continue with you. They, they paid attention for a short time to those naysayers, but the truth of the gospel would continue with them. 
So we see Titus wasn't compelled to be circumcised because he was a testimony to those naysayers. But in the meantime, Paul took this vow in order to win his people. Amen? Now we go back to Ephesians. We're about to go to Ephesians. Uh, back to Acts 18. So verse 21 says, but bade them farewell, oh, verse 20 rather, oh, 19. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. I like in Ephesus, it was, it was warmly received. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not. He said, I'd love to stay with you, but I have something to do. I must get to Jerusalem to keep this feast, to keep the, to keep the vow. He, but he, he had entered into the synagogue, reasoned with the Jews, as he normally did. They, they, and they liked him. They didn't reject him, but he had to leave. He bed, but he bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you if God will, and he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. And that is gonna be the kickoff of the third missionary journey. Once again, going back to Antioch and the first thing he does is he goes through Galatia and Phrygia. He goes through the areas where he went through the first time. And then he would, at the same time as he's heading out on that, we have this incredible, what's the uh, word I'm looking for? This, this strange thing that happens. Enter Apollos coming to Ephesus, where Priscilla and Aquila already were. I'm going to have to leave that for next week because it's an amazing story of what happens with Apollos and Priscilla and Aquila. Amen? The Lord's good. See how he works things out? You know, if it, if it takes getting a haircut to win somebody, go for it. <laughs> But, but Paul, because of the love of his brethren he had, would fulfill that vow because it was not against any law whatsoever so he could win his countrymen. And that's, that's the proper context of that. Yes, there are things that are under the law that as Christians, you know, I think it would be good to obey. I'll start with thou shalt not kill. Not murdering is a good thing to keep. Anybody disagree with that? Is there a hand I see? <laughs> Amen. The law is good if it's used lawfully. But today the law is never to be used to beat down people. It's to be used in order to build them up and to win them over. You know a Muslim can be won over by the law? Because the law of God is totally different than their law. The law of God has grace involved because there's a remedy for the things that are against the law. And that remedy is the Lord Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. That's the main thing. Uh, scratch that. It's not the main thing. It's the only thing that we need to trust today. Anything else just gets in the way, just complicates things. But Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, and rose again after three days. That is the gospel message. Anything else, anything else, either more than that or less than that, doesn't add up. It's not complete, or it's added too much to it. It's all we need for salvation. 
is to believe that message that Christ died, was buried, and rose again. Amen.